I'm going to approach this sermon a little bit differently. I'm not the first one to do this course, but it's really uh, designed to teach the truth of when a person becomes a Christian, but the way I'm going to present it is for you who are Christians. Or even if you're not, you have undergone what you call baptism. So I'm approaching this study with this question. Is your baptism scriptural? And let's just break it down as fundamentally and first principally as we can. First of all, no one will deny that something called baptism is in some way or the other a necessity. For this reason, or I can say that for this reason, is because Jesus commanded baptism. There are all sorts of people who believe Jesus to be the Son of God, the only Savior. And they're not going to deny Matthew 28, 19 and Mark chapter 16, verse 16. It's quite obvious for anybody that can read on a fifth grade level and to read those passages saying this is God's will through Christ to see that Jesus commanded baptism. You'll also see as you read through the New Testament that his apostles, the apostles of Christ, and the early disciples, evangelists in particular, commanded baptism. Acts 2, verse 38, the day the church started. People who heard the word, persuaded by it that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was the Son of God, they were pricked in their heart by the fact that they were sinners, <clears throat> had participated actually in the crucifixion of the one they claimed to be looking for and longing for. And they cried out unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Well, Peter's already declared Jesus at the right hand of God in heaven ruling. So he answers plainly in Acts 2.38, To believers, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. As you go further into uh, the book of Acts, Luke tells us in Luke chap or rather Acts chapter 10, verses 47 and 48, that God commands people to be baptized. So what have we seen? We've seen that Jesus commanded baptism, that the apostles and early evangelists commanded baptism. Now we're going to say at this time, whatever baptism is. Because I don't know of many people who claim to believe in Christ as their Savior, who hasn't undergone something they call baptism. So we must acknowledge that Jesus commanded it and that the apostles and early evangelists plan, uh, commanded it. But more than that, when we look around about us at those who believe in Christ today as a Savior, we're seeing mostly denominations. And they claim to be denominations. They're a part of the whole. They never claim to be the whole. Each denomination that I know of, by the very nature of what it is to denominate, claims to be only a part of the whole and that their particular group's not essential to salvation. And yet throughout all of these, many of them at least, the great majority practice some form of baptism. Yet uh, they vary as to what we would call the mode of baptism, whether it's immersing somebody in water or pouring or um, sprinkling water upon somebody. And they will have a proper subject for baptism. Some of them have infants, and it goes all the way from that up to those who are able to be persuaded by the truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, them being uh, particularly qualified to be baptized. And then when you look at the purpose of baptism, you see that most of them baptize to show that one's already saved when they first believed in Christ. Others baptize in order to be saved from one's past sins. Now, whatever the case, I want you to be asking any of us who have undergo what we call baptism, is your baptism scriptural? Is it in harmony? Is it in compliance with what is taught in the last will and testament of Jesus Christ, who everybody acknowledges that accepts the Bible in the New Testament in particular, is the Savior of the world, John 14, 6. But there's one thing that must be noted 
even while the New Testament was being written. When you come to the letter written to the church in Ephesus, and you turn over to chapter 4, and Paul talks about unity in those first four verses. He'll talk about the platforms or the planks in the platform for unity among God's people. And one thing he says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 5, there is one baptism. There is one baptism. Now that's the Holy Spirit through Paul writing part of the New Testament saying to the church at Ephesus, there is one baptism. I say that because if you read through your New Testament, you'll find several baptisms mentioned. Baptism of suffering and so on. Baptism of the Holy Spirit, baptism of fire. But by the time the Ephesian letter was written, God via the Holy Spirit through Paul writing part of the New Testament said there's one. Now, I think we have to ask the question, which one is it? Well, remember we already brought out Matthew 28, 19 and Mark 16, 16. Those accounts are Jesus, before he went back to heaven, giving what we call the Great Commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He says in Matthew 28, in that account, I will be with you all way even unto the end of the world. Now, if there's one baptism nearly 62 years or at least 32 years later, I read to you in Ephesians 4 and 5, and there was a baptism that Jesus says to be preached to all the world until the end of the world, what do you think that one baptism is? The one baptism is simply that one that is to be preached to the end of the world. But we cannot say there's many baptisms acceptable to God. I know that because I can read what I just read to you. There is one baptism. Now there's one baptism just as there is one Lord. And there is one God. And there is one faith. We can no more say there can be different baptisms acceptable to God than there are different lords acceptable to God. Now, how many lords are there? One. How many faiths are there? One. And how many baptisms are there? One. Which one is it? One to be preached at the end of time. So when you're sitting there thinking of your baptism, or you've got a checklist, are you first of all checking I'm telling you the whole truth of the gospel regarding baptism? And next of all, if you don't know that, you need to be studying well enough to know it. And next of all, you ought to be then enumerating the situations that help you say, I was baptized scripturally. And if you haven't been baptized, then you need to ask the question, when am I going to be baptized scripturally? And I'll have the wherewithal here to be able to tell what scriptural baptism is. So there are as many baptisms acceptable to God the Father as there are lords acceptable to God the Father. Now, this raises several questions. One may have been, to use the words of the world, baptized in some manner. I said that a couple times already. But the thing the world is not asking, those who are religious, that world, they're not asking anything much about whether what I believe in practice is scriptural. Let me ask you this. What is the purpose of the Bible in general and the New Testament in particular if not to find what God wants us to do to be saved and remain saved? What good is it to anybody? And the design of all inspired scripture, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is set out in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And 2, 15 of 2 Timothy says, we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God. And Paul declared to the Ephesians that he had written to them a four and few words. And when they read what he wrote, they would understand his knowledge and the mystery of Christ. So God made us in such a way that if we want to, we can learn God's will for our lives. And we can learn about baptism in that will. Now, 
if you were baptized or whatever you call baptism, you have to ask, was it scriptural? Was it the one baptism that Paul declared existed in Ephesians 4 and verse 5? And that was almost 2,000 years ago when he wrote it. There's been nothing to change that. And might one need to be rebaptized? I use that term uh, because really there's only one baptism. So if you're not baptized in Scripture, you haven't undergone the one baptism. I don't care how many times you've been put on the water. We're talking about scripturally baptized for the first time. Well, to aid us in answering this question, I want us to consider a few things. Let's look, first of all, at an example from the scriptures of people who were godly people. They were interested in spiritual things. They wanted to please God. And Paul runs into them when he comes to Ephesus, Acts chapter 19. There were disciples there, students. That's what we have in verse 1 of Acts 19. The apostle inquired as to whether they had received the Spirit when they had believed, Acts 19 too. Paul is testing them, and let me pause here and emphasize Four people who you don't know and know nothing about their history who says, yes, I'm a Christian. And we ask them the question, did you believe in Christ? And they say, yes. Did you repent of your sins? And they affirm the have. Have you confessed Christ? Yes, I confess him right now. I've confessed him from the time I believed in him. And were you baptized? Indeed, yes, I was baptized. And we stop right there. Do you know all the Bible says you need to know about that person as to whether that person is truly a New Testament Christian. I suggest to you, you do not. And Paul recognized that in the days uh, he walked this earth as an inspired apostle. He asked them, uh, have you received the Spirit? Now, I think he's talking about the miraculous workings of the Spirit that came through the laying of the apostles' hands because of what happened in the very context of Acts 19. But their lack of knowledge regarding the Spirit told him something he could not have known otherwise. The Great Commission, baptism of Matthew 28, where Jesus commanded, remember we mentioned that at least twice, people to be baptized, says that we're to be baptized in becoming a Christian in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How could you be a Christian and never have heard of the Holy Spirit? You're baptized by the authority of Christ, Acts 2.38. There's the other passage we noted. But to be baptized by the authority of Christ means you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So Paul knew immediately these folks are not Christians. He also had insights as to probably what they were because Apollos had been there before he had been taught the way of the Lord more perfectly by Aquila and Priscilla, and he only knew the baptism of John. Well, the baptism of John was for the Jews to get them ready for Christ and the kingdom he would establish. Well, that's long gone. Christ has come. Christ has suffered, bled, and died. Christ has gone back to heaven. The kingdom is here. It has been for some years at this time. Acts 2, verse, or let's say Acts chapter 2. So he learns about them more perfectly. Now, if you can, like Aquila and Priscilla, teach Apollos the way of the Lord more perfectly, then you can ask questions, as Paul did, to find out from people if they have truly obeyed the gospel in being baptized. That's exactly what Paul did. Is there authority in that for us? If it's not, I'd like to know why not. Christ commanded a baptism in the name of the Holy Spirit, Matthew 28, 19. So how could one have been scripturally baptized if they had not even heard of the Holy Spirit? You see, there has to be ways that we can know for ourselves and for everybody else as to whether the baptism we've undergone is truly one taught in the New Testament of Christ, the one the Lord commanded in Matthew 28, 
and in Acts 2. So we learn from verse 3, the latter part of verse 3, that they had only undergone John's baptism. Now notice, if you look in verse 4, I believe it is, right after that, Paul explains that John's baptism, I said this earlier, was to prepare the people for Jesus Christ. Verse 4. Well, hearing the difference, these people being honest-hearted, Luke 8, 15, desires to obey God. They've already proven that by doing what they did under John's baptism, that they were taught, didn't know any better. They did it. They went as far as they could, as far as they knew. They acted upon their knowledge, which is imperfect knowledge. They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, verse 5. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, we already know that that's what Peter and the other apostles told the penitent believers on the day of Pentecost, the day the church started. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. Now, what we have here may be easily overlooked. We have an example of rebaptism in the New Testament. Many years ago, there was a young couple. I already had kids up, I guess, in grade school, maybe even into... Uh, junior high and when I knew them they'd been a member of this congregation for some years one time he came to my office and he was perplexed he said I need to ask some questions I've got to clear some things up in my mind he said uh, I grew up in the Baptist church I was baptized for the same reason baptized, uh, Baptists baptize anybody I believed I was saved the moment I believed I was baptized to show an outward sign of an inward grace to imitate Christ. Well, I met my wife later on, and we married, and she was a member of the Christian church. And I continued, and I started going with her and continued to go with her. And uh, I'd been baptized, and that's all they told me I needed to do, so they accepted me into the Christian church on what would be Baptist baptism which any Baptist preacher will tell you is not for the remission of sins. It's because you're already saved, and that salvation took place according to Baptist doctrine the moment you believed and asked Jesus to come to your heart. But that's what they did. So as they went on down the road, since the Christian church does baptize for the remission of sins, Later on, they came in contact with somebody, and I don't know who it was. It was before they came to the church where I met them. And because that all, they told him, yeah, we've been baptized for the remission of sin. They accepted him right in, the Lord's church. Well, over the years in the church, there in particular, he began to hear all this preaching and had him bothered because he was hearing things he hadn't heard heretofore, certainly in the Baptist church and even in the Christian church. So he came up and said, now my problem here is I know I wasn't baptized in order to obtain the remission of my past sins. And I've already told you how it went along. Well, people can go through all those developments because they don't know any better. Now, some may do it in spite of what they know, but some just don't know any better. He says, but I, I want to know, is there authority in the scriptures to rebaptize somebody? Two numbers came to mind and the book where they're found, Acts 19. <laughs> because that's exactly what happened there. They obeyed authority that had been removed. It had fulfilled its purpose. It had been taken out of the way. And now the commission, baptism of the Great Commission was in effect. So I cited that. And I said, take it home, read it, and think about it. Now, he had read it before. He just never thought about it in that standpoint. So he came back and he says, well, it's very obvious. They thought they were doing right, but they obeyed their own baptism. He said, I, I have my wife here this afternoon, and I want you to baptize both of us for the remission of sins. Well, that's the ideal way it works. It ought to work that way when people learn. But it also tells us this. People can think. They can be right around us. And they need some questions asked, and we don't know to ask them questions, especially if you haven't known their whole history from the time they were born. <laughs> 
And as Brother Wallace used to say, the Lord never expected us to be the CIA and the KGB and the FBI all rolled up into one. Circumstances might mean you almost have to be that in situations. But in general, we accept what people say. And if you go up and say, well, you baptized scripturally, you were baptized for the remission of sins, most people will almost say that. I've seen Baptists say that. I know of a case where a woman was being taught the truth on the plan of salvation. And she declared up one side and down the other. She wasn't angry. I've been baptized for the remission of sins. Well, where were you baptized? I was baptized in a certain, certain Baptist church by a certain, certain preacher. Well, then if he baptized you according to Baptist doctrine, he did not baptize you unto for in order to obtain the remission of sins. Well, I know it was. Okay, guess what? He was still alive. So she went to him. And they renewed acquaintances, and then she asked him, when you baptized me, did you baptize me for the remission of my sins? And he almost jumped out of his chair. He said, no, I did not. Now, what does it tell you about people and their remembrances and their thinking? She knew she'd been immersed in water, and she knew she did it to obey God. But it wasn't enough. Because Baptist doctrine says you're saved the moment you believe, and then you're baptized later on. So she, upon the testimony of him, correcting her mind, being honest-hearted, like these people here in Ephesians 19, or rather Acts 19 in Ephesus, she obeyed the gospel. But brethren, that tells us in working with people, you have to know the right questions to ask. And don't think they're all being hypocrites and hard-hearted and trying to sneak in the back door. There may be some like that. But some just don't know. They literally don't know. Now, regarding their rebaptism, notice they had been previously baptized. But now we've already seen their baptism was lacking in some way, and that's a very important point. Even though it was immersion of burial in water, and even though John's baptism was for the remission of sins, Mark chapter 1 and verse number 4, quote, unquote, their baptism was not in the name of Jesus. Acts 2, 38, 10, 48, and chapter 19, 5. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord. Now, it doesn't mean just calling out, surely we know this by now, the name of the Lord over something and then doing it. That sanctifies it. It means acting according to what the words of the Lord in his New Testament has authorized you to do, whether in becoming a Christian or living the Christian lives. So what do we learn from this? Well, we may conclude that if our baptism, watch it, lacks in one essential element, one component part, then rebaptism is necessary. It all doesn't have to be just completely wrong. A part of it can be wrong. My brethren nowadays not appreciating the doctrine of Christ try to say, well, a little bit of error here when it's 99% good. Well, we don't, we can ignore that. Try that rat poison, see how it gets. Because it's over 99% good, I think, in rat poison. It's that one little bit that gets them. So determine whether rebaptism is required for us, maybe required for you. Then let's look at the elements of scriptural baptism. First of all, it must be the proper mode. Baptism in the New Testament was a burial. Romans 6.3, Colossians 2.12. And the Greek word, baptizo, means to immerse, to plunge, and to dip. First mode that's necessary. It's essential. If you're to know you were baptized scripturally, the biblical mode of baptism is immersion in water. But then we come to the proper authority. This is the second one that we shall emphasize here as to an essential element in scriptural baptism. It's in the name of Jesus. That is, baptism is in the name of Jesus. We've seen that already. Acts 2.38, chapter 10, verse 48, and Acts 19.5. By the authority, and not by the authority of anybody else. Now, which would have been a baptism? That is, scriptural baptism in the authority of Christ, as I said earlier. Which would have been a baptism? In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let me mention this. I've done it before, but I'll do it here again. 
In the King James Version, it says, in, I in, the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You look at the American Standard and have in two. There's two different things being said from Matthew 28, Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38 is making it very clear to all these Jews who are already devout and approaching God under the law of Moses that you've got to approach God now by the authority of Jesus Christ. He's the only begotten Son of God. He is the Messiah. That's what's emphasized in Acts 2.38. But Jesus is pointing out in Matthew 28 that you're baptized into a saved relationship with the Godhead 3. So to baptize by the authority of Christ, well, what do you authorize? To baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Maybe you've never asked yourself that question when someone baptizes. Now, when somebody baptizes this baptistry anywhere else, they don't have to say anything. It's the person being baptized that must know what he's doing. Then why do we say something? I'm saying it to the people out there so they'll know what's being done. That's the only reason. There is no set formula. There's nothing else. But what am I doing if I have the one doing the baptizing of someone else when I stand there and say, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for the remission of your sins. I'm telling people in the audience who are hearing me what I am doing. If that person being baptized doesn't already understand that, he doesn't need to be baptized. So let's keep that in mind. There is no set formula. You could say, I baptize you by the authority of Jesus Christ. And that's sufficient. But you have to be taught the Bible what that authority is. And of course, that's true of everything or none of it's any good. So there's the proper authority hooked to the proper mode. There's the proper purpose for the remission of sins. So the biblical purpose of baptism is for that reason. There's the proper subject. Now, baptism was commanded to those capable of believing and repenting. That ought to tell us what category of human beings are subject to obeying the command to be baptized, Acts 2.38. Baptism was permitted for those who possessed faith, Acts 8.37 and Mark 16.16. 16. What does that do to infant baptism? That baby doesn't have any ability to understand. The reasoning goes on in the gospel system to prove Christ the Son of God. And it doesn't have any sin to repent of. It doesn't know about repentance. So that destroys infant baptism. So the biblical subject for baptism is a penitent believer. Now remember, when one element is lacking, rebaptism was commanded, Acts 19, 1 through 7. In that case, it was despite having the proper mode or Purpose and subject. Having surveyed the essential elements of scriptural baptism, then just consider some cases. When rebaptism is necessary, if our, if our baptism involved the wrong mode, such as pouring water on somebody or sprinkling, as practiced by most denominations, Catholics, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Methodists, and I don't have any others, then our baptism lacked the proper mode. You're subject to be baptized according to one baptism of Ephesians 4, 5. If our baptism involved the wrong authority, if we were baptized by the authority of somebody besides Jesus Christ, maybe it was Ellen G. White of the Seventh-day Adventist or the Watchtower Society of Jehovah's Witnesses or according to Joseph Smith and the Mormons and any others you might lay down, our baptism was not the proper authority was not in or by the proper authority, Jesus Christ. So rebaptism would be therefore necessary. If our baptism involved, if, if our baptism involved the well the wrong purpose, if we were baptized as a public confession of faith, thinking we were saved at the moment we believed, as practiced by most Baptists, assemblies of God and whatever, then our baptism was not the right purpose. It was it for the remission or unto the remission of sins? So rebaptism will be required to ensure we've been scripturally baptized in the one baptism. If our baptism involved the wrong subjects, that is, we were not penitent believers. As is the case when people are baptized because all their friends were doing it. Because their spouse or their fiancé or their parents are pressuring them to do it. 
They don't do it just and only to please God, to be saved from their sins. As infants, when they had no choice in the matter, incapable of belief or repentance. Then our baptism was lacking the right subjects of the believers. So we need to be rebaptized according to the one baptism. Now, I think you knew this, but I don't know whether you ever looked at it from that standpoint. That's the reason I say this is a different approach. It teaches the plan of salvation, but it also says if you think you've been baptized scripturally, here's the way you can check it out. Remember, there's only one baptism commanded by Christ. It's for the remission of sins. It's a burial and immersion in water. And it requires a penitent believer. So my purpose is not to simply trouble one's assurance of salvation. But it's what Peter said in 2 Peter 1.10. It's to make your calling and election sure. I would think that's a thing we all ought to do. So because of the many baptisms taught and practiced in the religious world, we must never hesitate to ask, is your baptism scriptural? Is my baptism scriptural? Is it the one baptism Jesus commanded in Ephesians 4 and verse 5? If it isn't, when you honestly review what you've done and you call it being baptized, then I can only say to you at this point, as Paul was told when he was Saul of Tarsus and was found to be a believing, dependent person. And now, why tearest thou? Arise, be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. As a child of God, if you've sinned, we urge you to repent, come confessing those sins. We'll pray with you and for you. But do it now while it's time, while we stand and sing.